Acute coronary syndromes encompass a spectrum of conditions caused by reduced blood flow to the heart muscle. These include unstable angina, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and ST elevation myocardial infarction. Non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes are characterized by either negative or positive biomarkers with specific electrocardiogram findings like ST depression or T-wave inversion. ST elevation myocardial infarction is identified by ST elevation on the electrocardiogram and positive biomarkers. Understanding these classifications is essential for guiding treatment decisions. Pre-hospital assessment and management. Emergency medical services play a critical role in the pre-hospital phase for patients suspected of having an acute coronary syndrome. A 12-lead electrocardiogram should be performed within 10 minutes of first medical contact to detect ischemic changes. If ST elevation myocardial infarction is confirmed, immediate transfer to a hospital capable of performing percutaneous coronary intervention is recommended. The goal is to achieve reperfusion within 90 minutes of first medical contact. For every 30-minute delay in ST elevation myocardial infarction patients managed with primary percutaneous coronary intervention, there is a 7.5% relative risk increase in one-year mortality. If the electrocardiogram is non-diagnostic, transport to the nearest emergency department is advised. Initial in-hospital assessment. Upon hospital arrival, a focused history and physical examination should be conducted along with serial cardiac troponin measurements. A 12-lead electrocardiogram should be repeated within 10 minutes to identify evolving ischemia. Serial measurements of cardiac troponins help classify patients into low, intermediate, or high-risk categories using clinical decision pathways. This structured approach ensures timely risk stratification and appropriate management. Management of patients presenting with cardiac arrest. For patients who experience cardiac arrest, post-resuscitation care depends on mental status and the presence of ST elevation myocardial infarction. Awake patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction should undergo primary percutaneous coronary intervention. Comatose patients with favorable prognostic features may also benefit from primary percutaneous coronary intervention after individualized assessment. Immediate coronary angiography is not recommended for comatose patients without ST elevation myocardial infarction. Approximately 10% of patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction transferred by emergency medical services experience out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Standard medical therapy for acute coronary syndromes. Analgesic therapies provide symptomatic relief but do not improve clinical outcomes. Sublingual nitroglycerin is administered at 0.4 micrograms every 5 minutes for up to 3 doses. Intravenous nitroglycerin is considered for persistent pain, hypertension, or flash pulmonary edema. Morphine or fentanyl may be used for refractory pain. Persistent ischemic symptoms despite pain control warrant urgent coronary angiography. Aspirin therapy during hospitalization. Aspirin therapy is a cornerstone of acute coronary syndrome management. An initial oral loading dose of aspirin followed by daily low-dose therapy is recommended to reduce mortality and major adverse cardiovascular events. Oral P2Y12 inhibitor therapy during hospitalization. Oral P2Y12 inhibitors, administered alongside aspirin, reduce major adverse cardiovascular events in acute coronary syndrome patients. Prosugrel is contraindicated in patients with prior stroke or transient ischemic attack due to worse net clinical outcomes. Parenteral anticoagulation. Unfractionated heparin is effective in reducing ischemic events in non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes. Alternatives like anoxaparin or fondaparinix are recommended when early invasive strategies are not planned. Bivalarudin is an alternative to unfractionated heparin in ST elevation myocardial infarction undergoing percutaneous coronary intervention, reducing mortality and bleeding. Lipid management. High-intensity statin therapy reduces major adverse cardiovascular events in acute coronary syndrome patients. Adding non-statin agents like azetamibe or PCSK9 inhibitors is reasonable for those with low-density lipoprotein cholesterol levels of 70 mg per deciliter or higher despite maximally tolerated statins. 
beta blocker and renin angiotensin system inhibitor therapy. Early beta blocker initiation within 24 hours reduces reinfarction and arrhythmias. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers are indicated in high risk acute coronary syndrome patients to reduce mortality and major adverse cardiovascular events. Primary percutaneous coronary intervention in ST elevation myocardial infarction. Primary percutaneous coronary intervention improves outcomes in ST elevation myocardial infarction with goals of first medical contact to device activation within 90 to 120 minutes. Delayed percutaneous coronary intervention lacks benefit in certain scenarios. Reperfusion strategies at non-PCI-capable hospitals. Fibrinolytics are administered within 12 hours of symptom onset for ST elevation myocardial infarction if percutaneous coronary intervention delays exceed 120 minutes. Transfer to percutaneous coronary intervention-capable centers is recommended for failed reperfusion. Coronary angiography after fibrinolytic therapy. Early angiography within 2 to 24 hours with intent to perform percutaneous coronary intervention reduces death or myocardial infarction rates. Immediate rescue percutaneous coronary intervention is indicated for failed reperfusion. Timing of invasive strategies in non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes. Immediate invasive strategies within two hours are recommended for very high-risk non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome patients. Routine invasive approaches vary by risk category, with timing guided by Global Registry of Acute Coronary Event Scores. Catheterization lab considerations. Radial access reduces bleeding and mortality compared to femoral access. Intracoronary imaging aids complex percutaneous coronary intervention procedures. Routine manual aspiration thrombectomy in ST elevation myocardial infarction undergoing primary percutaneous coronary intervention lacks benefit. Management of non-infarct-related arteries in ST elevation myocardial infarction. Routine percutaneous coronary intervention of non-infarct arteries during primary percutaneous coronary intervention increases risks. Elective coronary artery bypass grafting or staged percutaneous coronary intervention may be reasonable for multivessel disease. Management of non-culprit lesions in non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes. Percutaneous coronary intervention of significantly stenosed non-culprit arteries reduces death or myocardial infarction risk. Coronary artery bypass grafting is preferred over multivessel percutaneous coronary intervention in complex cases. Revascularization in acute coronary syndromes with cardiogenic shock. Emergency revascularization improves survival in cardiogenic shock. Routine percutaneous coronary intervention of non-infarct arteries increases risks. Electrical complications post-acute coronary syndrome. Implantable cardioverter defibrillator implantation is recommended in selected postmyocardial infarction patients with left ventricular ejection fraction of 40% or lower. Temporary wearable defibrillators show uncertain benefit. In-hospital issues in acute coronary syndrome management. Admission to a cardiac intensive care unit is indicated for ongoing angina, hemodynamic instability, or arrhythmias, telemetry monitoring and echocardiography guide therapy. Patient education and follow-up care. Education on lifestyle modifications, medications, and follow-up care supports recovery. Annual influenza vaccination reduces major adverse cardiovascular events. Post-discharge systems of care coordination. Shared decision-making and addressing barriers to care improve outcomes. Referrals to cardiac rehabilitation are emphasized. Cardiac rehabilitation post-acute coronary syndrome. Center-based rehabilitation lowers morbidity and mortality. Home-based programs are reasonable alternatives. Dual antiplatelet therapy strategies post-discharge. Dual antiplatelet therapy duration varies by bleeding risk. Ticagrelor or prosugrel is preferred post-percutaneous coronary intervention, with aspirin discontinued after one to three months in select cases. 
antiplatelet therapy in anticoagulated patients post-discharge. Direct-acting oral anticoagulants plus clopidogrel for 12 months are recommended post-percutaneous coronary intervention in anticoagulated patients, with aspirin discontinued after 1 to 4 weeks. Reassessment of lipid levels post-discharge. Low-density lipoprotein cholesterol reassessment with fasting lipid panels at 4 to 8 weeks post-discharge guides therapy adjustments. Immunization management in acute coronary syndromes. Annual influenza vaccination reduces mortality and major adverse cardiovascular events in acute coronary syndrome patients. Future directions in acute coronary syndrome management. Evidence gaps include optimal telemetry durations, novel drug therapies, and mechanical circulatory support strategies. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.